Coming up on Digital Music Trends 212, recorded on the 10th of December 2014, Apple suit hit by a lack of plaintiffs, YouTube makes a database of music copyright info available to video creators, all the latest on the Indian music market with Times Music's COO, Groove Shark's new radio service, vinyl sales boom, the Pirate Bay goes offline and the new torrent chart shows music is still being pirated in high volumes, SoundCloud reportedly raising a massive $150 million round, and finally iPod Classic prices soar after Apple pulls the plug on the device. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Leonelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and uh, DMT is available on a wide range of services uh, but if you do want to enjoy the show when you're commuting or at the gym or on the go, uh, make sure you subscribe to it on the podcast app which is uh, built into the iOS 8 system now on uh, uh, Apple devices uh, or download uh, Dog Catcher for Android, uh, that's a great app that you can use if you have an Android phone to download the shows and have them uh, right there and catch essentially so uh, the show comes out pretty regularly towards the end of the week uh, but if you'd like to be the first to know when it comes out uh, do subscribe to the newsletter the newsletter is on bit.ly slash dmt list and this week it's a real pleasure to welcome back uh, uh, glenn peoples a uh, senior editorial analyst at billboard so hi glenn and thanks for joining me how's it going Hello again, Andrea. Uh, wonderful to be on your show again. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you. And uh, uh, we should be joined by Andy Malta, hopefully in a second, uh, from CMU, but he's having some issues with Skype, so fingers crossed he can resolve them. And also, uh, we're going to have a, a guest spot by Mandar Takur. I'm going to uh, uh, interleave that in the show uh, uh, sort of halfway through, and he is uh, from uh, the Chief Operating Officer of Times Music India. He's going to talk, uh, I'm going to talk with him about the Indian market. Obviously, uh, due to time zone issues, he was in India and, and Glenn you're in Nashville uh, it was uh, difficult to get you all on the show at the same time today uh, and uh, uh, so for, first of all I want to kick off with a, with a US uh, story and uh, uh, talk to, you know sort of updating uh, the audience around the Apple lawsuit and then a couple of days later after we recorded the show it did come out uh, the fact that they were essentially deleting music uh, purposefully uh, uh, that wasn't purchased on, on the iTunes store and uh, finally uh, uh, in the last snag uh, uh, of from Thursday till sort of Monday and, and today sort of it's evolving again it, it looked like the prosecution uh, was having a real hard time finding plaintiffs for the case uh, and uh, two plaintiffs uh, essentially are, 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 seem to be dropping off uh, the first one uh, dropped off already uh, because of, of an issue regarding the period when the when the iPod had actually been purchased was, which was outside of the period uh, uh, and, and required by the lawsuit uh, and the other person seemed to now be having a, a con- some sort of conflict of interest uh, 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 because the, the iPod was purchased by the firm that her husband worked with and her husband uh, worked in, in some respect in some DRM uh, related uh, uh, lawsuits and so uh, there are uh, conflicts there and she might have to withdraw as well and now it looks like uh, uh, Apple uh, sorry the prosecution may have found another uh, plaintiff in Barbara Bennett a 65 year old uh, uh, ice dancer from Boston that was flown into Oakland uh, uh, to testify in the US District Court uh, uh, just this week uh, and uh, she seems to fall within the period and so this they seem to have a plaintiff once again so glenn this is a this is a big mess uh, what is your take on the on the whole uh, apple lawsuit i mean last week we kind of talked about the fact that maybe this is not that relevant today i'm still into mind about that I, i'm not sure what do you think about it well as far as the the lawsuit and um the actual specifics of the case and whether or not the plaintiffs have a good case or plaintiff now as it as it seems to be yeah um you know I really don't know, and I, I'm not I'm not um, educated enough in 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 the law uh, and the legal matters in this case. Um, I did put up an article yesterday on Billboard uh, with some thoughts about the case. And when I look over this case, and I look over what really is at the heart of this case, which is digital rights management, yeah, um, I I see that the the music business has really come a long way and I think in a has progressed in a really good way since roughly 2006 I think which is the time period in which this lawsuit um, covers yeah. 2006 to 2009 if I'm not mistaken and if you think back to 2006 that was a year after the Grokster lost its case before the Supreme Court um, there were still some fire file sharing services but they were uh, they were kind of falling away and yeah. being forced out of business. And, um, you know, there were still DRM on Apple. That would disappear by early 2009. Uh, and so digital rights management has become 
much more acceptable because it really is part and parcel to access models, to subscription yeah, models. Exactly. Uh, you are paying for access to a service like Spotify. Once you're not paying anymore, you lose access to the downloads um, on your mobile device or your computer. And customers know this, and it's just an accepted part of the business model. So it's not that DRM has died, but DRM is in a much better place. And I think that that the services and the products available to consumers today are, are much better than they were. Consumers have much more choice. They have, they're treated more fairly uh, by the industry. Yeah. And DRM was basically saying, I, I don't know, I wouldn't go so far as to say it was a, an outright mistreatment of customers, but it was certainly displayed distrust. Yeah. Uh, it, it assumed that people were going to uh, do something uh, illegal yeah. uh, and engage in piracy. And uh, piracy is still a problem. I, I don't want to lead anybody to, to think I don't think it's still a problem. Yeah, we'll talk but about it's less later, of a problem. So. The services today make it less of a problem. And even though revenues are down considerably from 2006, um, I think customers have reason to be happier, the products are better, and ultimately that's good for the music business. Yeah. Um, now what happens with the case? Boy, it's, it's hard to say. Um, it certainly will be entertaining if the case <laughs> continues and we go through a discovery process. Yeah, uh, and, and I mean, like you, you made a really good point about DRM and the fact that the fact is that now DRM is much more uh, imperceptible than it was back then. Because I mean, uh, even you know, m most clearly, obviously, at the time of of having actual files that you had to migrate from uh, from one device to the other, and and if if the DRM wasn't correct, the files literally wouldn't play or broke. So that that was sort of the the, the most uh, uh, you know. A blatant and evident uh, problem with uh, with DRM, uh, sure. but also like you, you know, yeah. I I used to have a, a, a equivalent of Rhapsody, uh, sort of a Napster subscription back in in the early two thousands, uh, which was similar to a Spotify model in in the sense that it's it's remained similar, but uh, you actually had to move the files yourself, and again, yes. uh, those were DRM'd files uh, as part of a subscri subscri subscription model, uh, which were time stamped and would expire after a certain number of days if they didn't check in with the server, and uh, it was a pain because you could only use them with a certain device and that made it uh, you know that much harder to actually navigate now everything yes. is self-contained in the apps you don't have to deal with files and so you don't perceive the, the problem essentially the, the guesswork has been taken out i i subscribed to rhapsody uh, early part of last decade just like you um, i had a sandisk player yeah. be, so it was the one of the players uh, that you could use with rhapsody it was far inferior to the iPod, but I wanted to use a subscription service, so yeah. I put up with it. And I think put up with it is the right phrase. I mean, it was just <laughs> not a good experience. Uh, getting the files onto the device was, was often problematic. The device itself wasn't very good. Um, but, you know, with the advent of smartphones and apps that can be created by any, any number of, of services, um, the subscription service, that, that whole experience is far better. And yep. the DRM um, really rears its ugly head. Um, in, in, well, it barely rears its head. I mean, you know, DRM was, was present in the mind constantly uh, 10 years ago, from downloads you bought to tethered downloads you put on your device yep. to copy protection put on CDs. Uh, we just don't have that today. It's it's a much better experience. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we continue. And uh, Andy Malt, the editor of CMU, has managed to join us. Uh, thankfully, uh, Skype has uh, uh, has uh, given up uh, trying to give us problems. So, uh, hi, Andy. And thanks for joining us. How's it going? Hello, hello. Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. It's great to have you. And uh, I think your video is a bit scatty. So hopefully, uh, it's gonna work itself out. Uh, but I think it might be a connection problem. Uh, fingers crossed yeah. uh, that it will it will actually unfreeze itself. Uh, and uh, uh, Andy, we just talked about the. Uh, uh, Apple uh, lawsuit story and I was just gonna about to move on to the YouTube story so YouTube uh, announced a pretty major addition for videographers uh, this week and uh, uh, the company essentially recognized that uh, there was a problem with uh, uh, the way uh, its music policy was structured and uh, uh, on copyrighted music and essentially if you were a videographer and you were putting up a video with a copyrighted track on it you knew that uh, either it would be taken down by the rights holder or uh, it would be you know the, the rights on 
on that video will be hijacked uh, and essentially uh, uh, the rights holder will be able to claim the advertising uh, for for the video uh, and uh, so uh, but in some countries for example uh, YouTube didn't even have the rights to, to, to have the video there so to have the music there so that the video wouldn't be available at all so uh, now YouTube has announced a new tool which is a uh, pretty awesome which essentially allows uh, people to browse through uh, the entire catalog of music that's available uh, uh, on uh, YouTube uh, that is licensed and essentially look at uh, where uh, that music is blocked available and uh, whether those rights holders are okay with the uh, use on third-party videos and and, and, cl and claiming the the advertising on top of that uh, and uh, it's, it makes a fascinating read because like you, you can go and look at something like uh, uh, Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas and you can see that for example uh, if you use it for for a user gener generated video it won't be available uh, in the US and in Germany uh, uh, and so if you are a videographer you can decide whether that's a problem for you and whether you want to keep using that track um, so an interesting development here Andy uh, what do you make of, of this new tool and do you think that uh, it's it's overdue and, and does it help creators of that I definitely think it helps creators I think it's a, it's a good thing um, for, on, on both sides I think actually for various reasons yeah. I mean, as far as I can see at the moment you do have to go and look for it you can't you know it, it's not like you're going to get if you're uploading a video with copyrighted music in it it's going to bring up an alert saying are you sure you want to use this because this is going to happen yeah to it but I mean if people do use it and do find out what's happening with their videos before it's uh, you know, but before they upload, then that's uh, that's going to be a useful thing to them, and I think for the, for the label, uh, it might mean a few viewers on profiles saying, "Why are you taking my video down?" Right. Which you know, I know they get a lot of. Right, and and uh, I mean uh, the the interesting thing here is that of course there's no way to negotiate with the label so it's not even if you have a, if you have the opportunity to have a you know a video that's going to have many many millions of views and you'd like to use a copyrighted track it becomes very hard for the videographer to go to the artist and try and negotiate a rate to actually get this done it seems like the only way to do it uh, is via this uh, uh, system which essentially means that high profile videographers wouldn't want to use copyrighted music because it would hijack the majority of their of their ad rates on, on YouTube. Uh, uh, Glenn, uh, do you think that this uh, uh, this is kind of fun for, for us in the sense that I kind of enjoy just browsing through the list and seeing what countries, what artists were blocked where? It's hard to say if people are actually going to use this tool. It's great right. that it's available and it's great for people like you and me to look in there and get some visibility into, <laughs> into um, you know, the restrictions placed on these videos by yeah either the content holders or just the limitations uh you know because they don't have licenses for certain countries yeah yeah um, and it's exciting because so like, that you could know, be very fun and, yeah. and quite educational i think for us um whether or not someone is gonna you know check the check the uh you know information on a certain video before they make a video and upload it and before content id scans it and matches it to a recording and before they get some, you know, message that it's been removed, who knows? <laughs> um, maybe some people will. Yeah, yeah, there exactly. are third-party services available like Rumblefish where people can select uh, licensed music ahead of time and pay a small fee or maybe no fee. There are royalty-free videos out yeah. there. Yeah, sure. And, uh, and use something that they know will be allowed. Yeah. Now that doesn't that doesn't really count when someone wants to do a user generated, user uploaded video, yeah. Yeah. or something like Taylor Swift, right? Absolutely. But um, but what this really says to me is the the big business, and it is a big business of user generated videos is evolving. It's getting better for all parties, and you know I, I think better videos will and, and some revenue will be the result. Yeah, and I'd love to hear from maybe some of my listeners and, and hear if there is a process in place. Because well, let's say that you are a Sony Music and you have uh, essentially your entire catalog on, on Content ID and, and there's automatic steps that happen if, if uh, a video is detected to have certain characteristics or certain songs within it. Uh, so I wonder what happens if you know a videographer was trying to license that song uh, and pay money to Sony to do that, and then upload it on, on you know, for a, for a use on YouTube. Uh, you know, would there be a system within YouTube that can identify that that track has been properly licensed, and so wouldn't take it down in the process, or uh, do they all have to go through the same process? So that's that's a fascinating uh, part of it for me as well, to see if there are steps in place to allow people to license music properly uh, on YouTube or not uh, from from a major commercial player. Uh, and, and also the cool thing was uh, to, to look at uh, the fact that none of the music is available in Germany, obviously because uh, there's still the... <laughs> 
<laughs> the issue with Gemma going on. So if you look at uh, any of the commercial tracks on that list, uh, they're all uh, uh, barred in Germany uh, as well. And it's a real pleasure today to welcome to the show uh, the Chief Operating Officer of Times Music India, Mandar Thakur. So hi Mandar, thanks for joining me. How's it going? Thanks, Andrea. All good here. It's great to have you. And so today uh, we're going to have a, a bit of a catch up uh, talking about what's been happening in the Indian music market over the last uh, uh, sort of uh, 10 months, really, since we spoke uh, last time at Medium. And uh, there's been a lot happening, really. Uh, yep. So uh, first of all, let's uh, try and address uh, the uh, more general issues around uh, sort of the, the development of uh, technology in the Indian market over the last year. So uh, one of the things that you pointed out was the fact that uh, uh, streaming may be aided by the uh, rollout out of 4G uh, in, in the country. So uh, what's the develop latest development on that and how is that uh, progressing? I think the, the first part is I did mention, I remember in the last uh, interview that uh, some of the world's leading streaming services were entering India and you also had a big wrap up of the Indian streaming services. Yeah. So today uh, we are very close to RDO launching live uh, within the next couple of months. Guvera, an Australian service, has already launched uh, last month into India. Uh, at, at some stage, there will be a Spotify uh, rollout, I guess, over the next six to eight months. Um, uh, and you have the other services like YouTube, uh, music subscription and other services about to start rolling out. So what we are seeing is the is pretty much the start of the rollout of these services yeah. without a, three, a 4G platform as yet. So what would happen is I think these services will have a long time to sort of set in, get user engagement going. And when the 4G platform launches, which is now expected first quarter 2015, right. you will actually have a, a phenomenal boost to a lot of these services, particularly the video services as well. Yeah, and it's, it's kind of weird because, you know, you mentioned all these services that are, uh, there's a few, there's about four or five uh, uh, local services, essentially, and uh, and then there's these international players coming in, uh, you know, yeah. it, it, is the market big enough to sustain such a large number of services at, at, at the moment? I look, we have a lot of people here. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so I, I think it, it sort of self answers the question whether the market is big enough. I think yes, because we are a very, very nascent market as such. Yeah. Uh, what is tending to happen is that we are a massive social media market. So the ability for people to consume things online is already set. Once a habit has been set in, then it's sort of easy to ramp up from there. So I think from that perspective, I would say yes. Number two is that uh, services like Ghana.com, which is India's number one music streaming site and is actually owned by Times Music's parent, the Times of India group, is, you know, you're talking about millions and millions of music uh, subscribers already online. Right. Another service called Savan, S-A-A-V-N, um, already has another few million people already subscribing to it. So it's not new for people to consume music. It's just, I think, a proliferation of a lot of branded players, a lot of global players that also mean larger catalogs, better UIs, uh, will sort of fire up the market already that's, that's got fire. Yeah. I think what will add more uh, coal to the fire is the imminent launch of Reliance 4G's own service which will right. be branded. It's a telco-based service, but it's 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 across Reliance's 4G platforms that has video, gaming, music, television, like a whole host of services. You oh, know wow. that will definitely yeah add fuel to the fire. Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, I I would imagine also uh, there's an interesting battle here between uh, uh, local services and uh, uh, services coming from outside. And and uh, uh, talking about that, how do you feel about uh, Ardio's play in in binding Ghana? Do you think that that puts them in a better position than Spotify when? When it comes to local catalog uh, and, and being able to to have access to, to that uh, large amount of, of uh, India repertoire? I, I think it certainly does. Uh, there's no question about it that uh, I would believe that RDO bought Dingana pretty much for two things. I think not necessarily just the catalog licenses. Yeah. Uh, but I think it was for the expertise of the founders when it comes to the Indian diaspora, not only for India, but I think the rest of the world. I mean, you're talking about one of the top five diasporas uh, of non-resident Indians in the world, and that's a lot to tap into. So I think what RDO actually bought into was really that more than anything else, and that is, no question about it, a tremendous advantage. That's Yeah, that, that, that's actually a very good point, the fact that uh, uh, obviously the, the Indian local catalog is not going to be listened to only in, in India, but there's a huge uh, amount of people uh, all over the world that are going to be interested in, in, in having access to that and uh, uh, and so uh, you know looking at uh, um 
how social is playing in a part in, in this uh, uh, development of streaming services. We've seen, for example, Savna partnering with Twitter uh, to bring a tweet-powered radio uh, a service uh, over the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, and so do you think there's going to be more tie-ups uh, with uh, social uh, services? And uh, which one would you think would be the most influential right now in India? Would it, would it be Facebook? I think no question about it. It's Facebook because, uh, you know, uh, we are one of the top, again, five or six markets of Facebook in terms of growth. Yeah. So without a question, I think Facebook really towers over Twitter in terms of influence. Yeah, absolutely. And so, uh, you know, in, in that sense, uh, do you think that... Uh, you know, Savna and, and Ario to a certain extent and Guevara are right in talking about uh, a predominance of uh, radio-like services in the sense of uh, stations that you can st sort of uh, put on and, and st start playing music essentially rather than on demand? Or do you think there's still a strong, dem uh, you know, a strong component of on demand that, that will, will uh, play a part in the market? I, th I think it, it would be pretty much the same behavioral habits that is in the West. Yeah. I don't think there are radically different behavior habits in when it comes to India. It's just, I think, a question of um, of a choice for a consumer. So when, when, I, when I use a service more and more, I start discovering more and more features of the service. And that's when I realize that I can actually customize it. Yeah. So given the different genres that are actually so wide in Indian music, it could mean that, that somebody who listens to one genre may actually just not even be aware of another genre or listen to it. And I think that's the time when on-demand radio services will really pick up. But I think um, it, it, it may be a little premature to think that that would be the first thrust of the services. Sure, sure. And, uh, you know, uh, you, you pointed uh, at uh, an interesting investment that happened uh, 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 last month, really, that was announced last month, which is uh, the investment by uh, SoftBank of uh, almost a billion dollar. It's over 800 million, uh, essentially, in, uh, in, in the Indian internet firms. So, uh, essentially, you know, uh, SoftBank is making a big play in the Indian market. Uh, you know, they're seeing uh, the growth of technology over there. And so how do you think that plays into the development of media? Media and entertainment offerings, and do you think this will, uh, uh, you know, enhance the value and, and perhaps uh, uh, give them more of a cloud to to, to raise more funding uh, if if required? I think um, the investment from SoftBank, when I spoke on the streaming panel, was really more to look at the Indian scenario with the new Modi government, right. um, and and to look at the economy opening uh, like completely as much as that. I mean, one is SoftBank, but there's a whole host of others at this time that are actually rushing into India. It's almost like a gold rush. Right. Whether it will last out, time will tell. But what tends to happen is that this sparks up a lot of services and entrepreneurship particularly within sectors of the internet. Now, the big thing I think about SoftBank's investments, I think, is in, in, in two sectors. One is, of course, retail, we know, with uh, local homegrown stories like Flipkart, uh, uh, Snapdeal. These are people who are giving Amazon a run for their money. Uh, and, and SoftBank obviously wants to invest in these companies. But, they're, yeah. but you're also talking about investment in cap companies that are competitors to the likes of Uber, people like Ola cabs and things like that. I think what this does is actually change the single most important behavioral habit for Indians, which is the use of credit card. Right. Now, people may not, people may still have been loath to use the credit card on, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, let's just say on a, on the music streaming side, but when you use a credit card for a utility, which is a taxi or a shopping for groceries yeah. or whatever, you start getting used to the habit. So I believe that in a roundabout way, all the proliferation of services over the internet, whether it's retail, shopping, cabs, are getting people more and more used to using their credit cards and and uh, you know internet based wallets like the Paytm that Uber uses. Yeah. Uh, and that would habit would then translate to consumption of entertainment, music, and movie services over the internet. Yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, uh, uh, it, it, it's a, a very different market, but a very similar situation with credit cards was Italy. And uh, uh, up until a couple of years ago, uh, literally most of the people that I knew were super diffident of using credit cards. They didn't want to use them over the internet. They only used them in stores. And so, uh, but in the last couple of years, we've seen the explosion of, of uh, online services there as well. And uh, a lot more people are confident in using credit cards and, and they feel like it's a it's, it's safe essentially it was before they didn't think it was uh, and that's in large part due to stuff like the app store and uh, you know uh, uh, absolutely 
absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, talking about uh, platforms, obviously in India, uh, uh, Nokia was the big player when it came to uh, uh, mobile phones. Uh, Nokia has kind of, uh, is still there as a, a strong force when it comes to very low end uh, handsets or, you know, uh, feature phones, essentially. Uh, but when it comes to smartphones, which are, are becoming, you know, of course, the, 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 the driving force of, of growth, uh, are we looking at uh, low cost uh, Android phones? Are they coming from China? What kind of manufacturers are, are taking hold there? I, I think, uh, you know, from where we last left off, uh, the pecking order was obviously the Koreans were leading, I think, in yeah. uh, with Samsung and LG and then followed by Micromax, the local players, and so on and so forth. And of course, Nokia's dropped market share drastically. But two significant developments have gone on since the last time I chatted with you. One is the launch of Android One. So the global right. launch of Android One was done in India. Right. And that sort of signifies the importance that Google and the operating system is giving to the emerging markets. Yeah. Uh, that's one. The second is, I think, in terms of services, there are there are two kinds of Android systems. I think one is the free to use system. And the second is where I guess Google gets a royalty. Uh, and, and that's a system that I think Samsung and all these people use. Uh, which also comes with inbuilt services and things like that, which are not in the, the free system. Right. And today with the proliferation of Android One at a grassroots level, I think you're talking about all the Google services that come along with the package are actually also going to be present on some of the low cost handsets. Yeah. That would mean that the local manufacturers, people like Micromax, which are really, really huge, would get a tremendous boost uh, in OS, in services, and delivery to consumers, right? So that's one very significant sort of operation. Yeah. The second one is the actual growth even bigger of the local players. So today, you know, you've, you've got Apple getting a boost, but more importantly, you've got Micromax and Carbon and the other players actually jumping in leaps and bounds in terms of sale. Yeah. So the Android One OS combined with the accessibility of and a better servicing, I think, of Micromax and handsets like that are actually seeing a large enough drive for even better consumption of uh, of smartphones. So it's just getting bigger and better, you yeah. know, honestly. And do you think like uh, that there might be a trend there where we're going to see some handsets uh, leap outside of China and, and start uh, uh, working in the, in the international sphere as well, like we're seeing with Xiaomi in, in China? Well, um, I, I know that Micromax has ambitions overseas, and I know they're working. I mean, for Christ's sakes, I mean, Hugh Jackman is uh, Micromax's global brand ambassador. Really? So they're, they're sort of <laughs> putting it, right? Yeah. <laughs> I Absolutely. mean, I don't know how many people know Hugh Jackman in India, but they, you know, I mean, it, it just shows the length of their global ambitions. And, and, and with due respect to Xiaomi, I think even, you know... Uh, uh, Xiaomi has made such a great dent in India. I mean, I mean, people are just like lapping up those phones every time they open up a flash sale for a few seconds or whatever they do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, you know, I was I was looking at an article about sort of four uh, big uh, streaming services in India, and there was one actually that I hadn't uh, heard of before, uh, which was called uh, Hungama. Uh, so, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Is 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 that service? Uh, uh, how how is that doing? Okay, so Hangama is a service which is, you know, the app is owned by one of India's largest mobile digital aggregators right. called Hangama, hangama.com, and they're one of the oldest uh, aggregators. So they, they sort of work exclusively with a bunch of uh, record companies. They also are very big in the telco space. Right. So the Hangama app is uh, one of the apps that's also uh, a local playing app. I, I think they had a very significant advantage when they had T series, which is you know, which is India's largest music company and has a strong right. dominance on Bollywood repertoire, Bollywood music repertoire. So when Hangama had an exclusive deal, I think with the Bollywood music repertoire, uh, they had an obvious edge in terms of pure pure repertoire being uh, being uh, being available exclusively on Hangama on the app. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I believe that has now changed with Savan and Ghana also having access to the same sort of large Bollywood catalog. So so I would imagine what would have been an a, a advantage has now turned into pretty much a level playing field. Yeah. Uh, but it's a great app. I mean, you should use the app because they're a very Bollywood heavy, Bollywood centric app. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know where they are in the pecking order because I know that Angama is, uh, uh, Ghana is probably one, Savan is number two. 
uh, maybe you know Hangama follows then, but we normally track the number one and number two. Yeah, sure. And and, and finally, I wanted to close by asking you about obviously in in in, in North America and Europe, where there's been a, a, a long debate this this uh, autumn about uh, uh, royalties that have been paid by Spotify, the the placement <laughs> of uh, uh, streaming services, uh, and, and you know the windowing of releases uh, by the likes of of Taylor Swift and, and, and other players. Uh, it was in Coldplay and Beyonce uh, just released. Uh, their their albums on Spotify after months uh, months since they were uh, released uh, as as a, as a physical yeah. CD and as a digital download. And so, uh, has that debate had any uh, repercussions in the, in the Indian market? Have we seen any artists starting to question uh, how much they're earning from these services? And if so, w- what is that debate like? No. Uh, well, firstly, you know, let me let me try and take a step back. That I think it's a. Uh, uh, Everybody's entitled to their own, I think, including Taylor Swift. I, and I think uh, Taylor was probably making a very, very large and bold statement when she pulled out, uh, pulled out of Spotify. Now, a lot of it, you know, every calculation eventually in the music business has to boil down to money. I, yeah. And and my view is like this. One is that I think it's hard for anyone to judge and say whether Spotify is going to be... Uh, the, the number one music gen- in income generating company, I'm not sure. Whether streaming is a future, yeah. I mean, in the foreseeable future, for the next three or four years, streaming is surely the future. Beyond that, it would be only an idiot who would say that for the next 10 years, I, I, I can see a future in this ever choppy world, right? So that's my view. The second view is... On one hand, I can see the point of Taylor Swift actually pulling out the catalog because it does hurt her sales. What all she is trying to do is actually make a very smart marketing move and divert customers to where she finds bigger value. Yeah. Right. Now, that's Taylor Swift. Whether that strategy works for everyone, I don't think so. Yeah. Taylor Swift probably doesn't need Spotify as much as Spotify needs her. And given that negotiating position, I would imagine that, you know, I would I would like to make as much money as I can in the next two, three years. And I want to divert it to where I make the biggest value. Simple yeah. as that. However, having said that, uh, and one of the things I want to say is I think Daniel Ek was probably right when he said you cannot look at Spotify as another iTunes because it's not. It is if in effect, uh, uh, in, in my view, and this is a very personalized view, not my company view, that it is like any other radio service except it's a customized radio service available on the internet where where you know you can do what the hell you want yeah. now if you had the same thing with terrestrial radio or cable radio only publishing gets paid you know, never get paid for the masters right. so if you juxtapose the same logic onto the fact that spotify is actually broadcasting or narrow casting whichever it applies with many consumers and actually paying a little tipple for it it's actually not a bad deal you know yeah. We just have to learn to differentiate where our money is coming from and what are we going to do with the services. Because I think the the problem is that the record industry is so over dependent on one or two services for their livelihoods that we now think that anything those services do, they need to run it by us and we need to decide the future. And I think that's a that's an idiotic thing to do. You know. Yeah, and, and from an infrastructural point of view as well, like uh, I guess my question was also around how uh, musicians perceive the distribution of money to, to occur uh, in India. Is uh, you know we're seeing that a lot of companies uh, in the even in the yeah. UK have issues with the amount of data that comes in. Uh, you know the the collection societies uh, are doing the best job they can, but again, uh, transparency is still an issue. So how, how's the situation in India as far as collection societies and as far as the actual distribution of of, of the money? Okay, so let me let me take that in two parts. One is the collection and remittance of money by, you know, people like Spotify. And, and I would like to add here is that I don't think there's much wrong with Spotify's reporting systems as much as uh, that their calculation of royalties and how they calculate those plays needs to be refined a bit more. But hey, look, it's only three years or four years that Spotify has really been in that large an existence. If you expect a service like that to have it all nailed down in year one, again, that's that's been the problem with the record industry. You you know, firstly, you can't do it yourself. And then when somebody does it, you try and scream blue murder about it, which which is why this industry is a problem, you know, and I'm very happy to be quoted on that. Second is that 
while Spotify works towards a highly refined system, you have to understand that the music labels, the music publishers, the music collection societies, I mean, they use e-systems that are even more outdated than what a Spotify can remotely come. So it's Spotify's data to be processed by outdated systems and then given to a musician. Yes, of course, musicians will complain, you know, very, very simple. Now, when it comes to India, I think we are in probably an even greater sort of situation at the moment where, you know, our, our collection society, IPRS, is, uh, you know, is, is in, a, in a sort of state of changeover. Um, and, you know, we we're all sort of in the middle of a similar kind of situation like the West. So it's nothing new or nothing bad in that sense, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's it's. I think it's going to be another interesting uh, sort of uh, year for the indie music market in 2015. I I also wonder sort of what kind of place uh, India is going to have in the whole uh, sort of Southeast Asia uh, debate. I guess it's, it's the whole area is just uh, essentially exploding with with music services, and there's so much happening there. So, uh, yeah. I mean. An exciting time. Do you, do you think there's a chance that some of the Indian music streaming services might actually expand into some of those markets as well, and we might see a bit of a reach out? I I would imagine so. I I think the you know the the thing with India is that we have so many people that it will be a while uh, till the time that a lot of these services will actually branch out to other markets. So I would imagine the evolution of these services globally would be in three steps. One is India itself with Indian repertoire and international repertoire. I think that's an uphill climb by itself, just given the sheer size of the market. Yeah. The second one is uh, Indian repertoire to be used for the Indian diaspora in the other markets, which is really the US, UK, Canada, some parts of Europe, and then Southeast Asia. And the third is, again, a truly global services where you are sort of all things to all people. And I think that's the last step that may really take a few years, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and actually, well, for final question, I want to ask you about uh, location. So there's, there's a lot of services now uh, uh, in India. Where are they based? Is there a hub? Is there a city where most of the services are congregated? Yes, most of the services are based in Mumbai. Uh, Mumbai is the entertainment and commercial capital of, uh, of India. There is one service that is actually based in Delhi, which is Ghana. Uh, but pretty much, you know, I mean, most people really operate between Bombay, Delhi, uh, Mumbai and Delhi, with Mumbai actually having the, the largest uh, sort of... Uh, office and headquarters of most of the streaming, music industry, streaming services, digital services, telcos, so on and so forth. Awesome. Well, Mandar, it was a pleasure talking to you today. And uh, as far as uh, Times Music India, people can follow uh, the company on at Times uh, Music uh, uh, India. Uh, and uh, uh, the website uh, as well is uh, timesmusic.com. And you'll find all the information on the company there. Uh, Mandar, thanks so much for your time today. Uh, you know, mm. moving on, I wanted to talk a little bit about Groove Shark. So Groove Shark is a bit of a strange player. Uh, I keep kind of forgetting about Groove Shark, and we don't really talk about it too much on the show. But I do encounter people from, uh, from time to time that uh, still use it, uh, and they find it to be, you know, the service that that they prefer using. Essentially, uh, it's also a question of costs, of course. And uh, uh, you know, Groove Shark uh, CEO Sam Tarantino announced in an interview with the Wall Street Journal uh, that they are launching a new app in January, uh, following some rumors that the company wasn't doing too well and may may not have lasted uh, after Christmas but obviously the this this uh, news uh, kind of uh, goes to discount to those those rumors and the the app will be available on both iOS and Android and will cost 99 cents per week and will provide a very much a Pandora like experience although Tarantino said that they have a few aces up their sleeves and they have a few uh, new things that they're trying to introduce as part of the app and uh, so uh, you know what do you make of Groove Shark at this point uh, uh, Glenn uh, can they come back? Uh, is there any goodwill, you know, within the industry to left uh, to uh, to see that company grow again? And 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 how might that happen? I, I seriously doubt there's any goodwill toward Groove Shark. Um, record labels and publishers uh, have long memories, and they tend to hold grudges. So yeah. um, I don't think there's going to be any any uh, hugging going on anytime soon. Um, Groove Shark is taking a route uh, with this radio app that d means they don't have to negotiate directly with labels. Yeah, uh, they're taking the statutory license offered by U.S. copyright law, which means the service will be available only in the U.S. Uh, unless they plan on skirting those rules too. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
And I, correct me if I'm wrong. You said it cost a dollar a week. I, I believe it cost a dollar a month. Oh, a month. Sorry. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's which right. makes it which makes it much lower than uh, than something like Pandora's yeah. subscription service, Pandora One, which is roughly a dollar a week. Yeah. Um, and, and and how sustainable is that? I have no that, doubt right? that it could be a, a, a good uh, internet radio service. Um, I, I think internet radio services are kind of all grouped together. It's really hard to, to tell them apart. I think Pandora tends to give give an experience that people like the most. Yeah. Uh, they have a lot of, of listening history there, so it helps them predict what songs people want to hear at what times. They might have an advantage. Um, you know, Google with the songs acquisition is now an internet radio. So yeah. there's that. Apple's in there with iTunes Radio. Uh, Groove Shark is coming late to the party, and maybe they feel like a legal service that helps funnel people toward their subscription service uh, is a good way to go, or yeah. at least it gives them a legal service that is undoubtedly legal. Yeah, where and it gives them like the, a the main service operates in a big gray area right now. Yeah, it gives them a bit of a platform, right, so that they, they can have something they can sell or raise money around uh, at the very least. Uh, Andy, uh, f from your point of view, have you do, do you know people that still use GrooveShark? Uh, how do you feel about the service itself and then this new this new announcement of, of, of a radio like app? Well, like you say, occasionally you do come across people who, who still use it and kind of you know, talk about it in positive terms. Um, and it tends, I mean, a lot of people I meet who use it are kind of people who aren't necessarily in the digital music industry. You know, they're outside, they just, they just kind of like using. Yeah. Um, and I think, I mean, in terms of this new app, like there is a place for low cost streaming services that will get a completely different bit of the market that like, you know, Spotify the, at the opposite end is, is getting. Yeah. Um, but, well, we've seen, you know, with things like Bloom that it's not as easy as all that to set up such a service. And I don't think Groove Shark is the company to, to be doing it because like you say, like, you know, the major labels just want Groove Shark gone now and they're not, they don't care if they come up with a brilliant money making service really. Yeah. And it kind of, it, it, a dollar a month, uh, if somebody uses it heavily, surely they're going to use up more royalties uh, in terms of, you know, even even the, the tiny compulsory license fees for a dollar a month that they might use them up, you know. <laughs> so, well, is there yeah, much yeah, revenue uh, there to, to be made? <laughs> no, and like what, you know, it, 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 Obviously, if you if you're charging low prices, you've got to get a lot of people using it for it to be worthwhile for, for you know for, for either the company or the the rights holders. Yeah. Um. So it's gonna it's gonna take some doing for them to to really turn this into a successful business. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Oh well. Uh. I, you know. I, I kind of wish them luck. At, at the end of the day, you know, they are trying to do something legal, and so that's uh, that's always good. Uh. But it may be a little late at this point for them to change your tune. Although you know, uh, uh they actually uh, hit back at uh, 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 Daniel Ek because Daniel Ek named uh, Groove Shark directly, uh, kind of in relation to Paris, essentially, in, in one of his uh, uh, remarks in the last uh, couple of months. And they actually hit back uh, by saying that essentially, uh, you know, Groove Shark are now a legal service and they now have deals with uh, uh, hundreds of rights holders and so they have a lot of legitimate content on there as well uh, but you know the the fact is that they don't have deals with some of the big players and and but the music is still there so uh, there's a lot yeah. of issues around that well the big players are the ones who are suing them and yeah. uh if if that doesn't go to appeal then uh it, i believe i'm right on this that it it goes to the judge to uh, determine uh, determine the, the penalties, the fines that yeah. would. Yeah, you know, there are very big fines involved with um, with copyright infringement. Yeah, ridiculously so, big fines. <laughs> so that is hanging over Groove Shark, and I think um, I think the financial health uh, over the long term is is seriously in doubt right now. Yeah. Um, now they've been able to survive for a long time, and much longer than uh, myself or, or a lot of other people expected them to yeah. um, they are tenacious and so they might get through you know who knows it's, it's very hard to say um, it, it's hard to see them getting through a significant financial penalty in this case yeah or maybe they went on appeal I mean it, who knows it's, it's, it's hard to say <laughs> um, yeah but you know they 
I, I said they're tenacious, and I think putting out a, a radio app in a very crowded market and, and taking a different path uh, shows that they're tenacious and they're still fighting. It's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Considering you know the, the amount of uh, headaches they had to go through and, and the problems the company had, uh, it, it's uh, you know interesting to see them hanging on there and <laughs> actually yeah. you know keeping well, going. People, you know, I don't know. I don't meet many of them, but clearly some people out there and many people out there still really like the service. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe it's a case of it, they've been using it a long time and they're just, they see no reason to move elsewhere. There certainly are a lot of options out there. Yeah. Uh, but GrooveShark has been around a long time. That might serve them well uh, in, in getting this radio app off the ground. Yeah. And, and uh, let's talk about piracy uh, for a few minutes because uh, uh, we have a couple of uh, different news. First of all, uh, the breaking news of the last 24 hours is that the Pirate Bay is down. I believe it still is down at the time of recording. Uh, or maybe not actually. Uh, Glenn, you were saying that it, it's back up now? It is up with... Uh with the Costa Rican Costa Rican. domain, right? Uh, so it's the pirate. It was up but not CR, working properly, I think. And I believe it's still available. Right, yeah. but yeah, for it was uh, it was down for at least uh, on, on uh, as the main domain uh, uh, for a, a good twenty four hours uh, uh, following a raid by uh, Swedish police, uh, and uh, it, that was in the neighborhood of Naka uh, in the sub suburbs of Stockholm, and uh, uh, apparently, you know, this was led by obviously the uh, the prosecution that is specializing in file sharing in uh, Sweden. Uh, they confirmed that the raid happened and they seized. Uh, a bunch of uh, servers of computers and uh uh, they went in with Digital for Senex as well, so uh, interesting to see there whether that helped them in the effort of actually shutting down the site, uh, other than uh, you know just uh, uh, grabbing a few a few computers, uh, which is what they would have done maybe if they hadn't brought the for Senex along with them. And uh, the Paris, uh, Parabase main site is down as well as uh, superbly.org, and uh, uh, you know this is a uh, kind of the, the saga of the Parabase drags on in Sweden. It's surprising that again they are still going in that country, considering that uh, as, as some the founders have uh, uh, faced considerable uh, jail sentences. Uh, Peter Sunde uh, has just come out of jail last month after six months uh, in prison uh, and after being on the run for a couple of years, I believe, as well. And uh, uh, and so the battle between the Swedish police and the Parabay continues. And, and uh, uh, you know, but Andy, are you surprised to see that they are still operating in Sweden and uh, given all the everything that's been going on for them? I don't know if I'm surprised to see it still operating in in Sweden, I mean, I don't know, it's kind of, I suppose it's the thing that still rumbles on, it's the thing that still gets a lot of attention, but it, it yeah. I don't know, it's, it's kind of, it seems a bit like a relic now, and it was interesting to see Peter Sunder's um, blog post on the shutdown saying he hopes it stays down now because, you know, it's so far from the the ethos of, you know, what it was, you know, the idea that it was originally set up with, and yeah. it's now kind of, you know, it, it's just covered in adverts and it's not really about... I don't know. He was talking about like it's kind of weird to be on his side with him, and you know, yeah. him taking the kind of the moral standpoint against what the pirate base become. Yeah. Um, but it's like I mean, obviously, you know, it, it's it's very easy to it's, it's, it's you know, despite these takedowns, it's quite an easy service to keep online, and yeah. it's the it's the big name in that field. So if if it's if you can keep it running and stick some adverts on it and make you know, decent money off it, then someone will. And uh, Glenn, from your end, you know, do you, uh, is the Parabase still a big name in the US and sort of, uh, again, uh, recognized as, as a synonym of, of piracy uh, or have people moved on to, to different services? Well, I think it's definitely well known in the US. Um, you know, the Pirate Bay seems to be a, a favorite cause yeah. of, of a certain type of, of uh, you know, internet supporter who wants freedom, who might have a, a very strange definition of fair use, uh, who might be a, more of an anarchist. I mean, I, I think there's, there's all kinds of people who support it and who support it, you know, um, I think for not nefarious reasons. They yeah. just want an open internet. Um, but... You know, the, the entertainment companies and governments fight against piracy continues. So it's, it's not terribly surprising to me that the Pirate Bay would be targeted. Yeah. Uh, if, if they're going to go after any uh, site, <laughs> it's going to be the Pirate Bay. Yeah, exactly. And I'm and, pretty sure some, some label heads this morning were pretty happy. Yeah. So, so I think it continues. The, the numbers I've seen about piracy in the U.S. is piracy has gone down. It still exists. There's a lot yeah. of it. It's, it's both movies and television, like movies and television being a video category, and music. Mm. Um, so it's still there. 
Um, but, I, you know, I don't know. After the Pirate Bay, there's, my guess is, and I could be wrong on this, there's pretty far drop off to the next. Yeah. Uh, I mean, BitTorrent is really by far the most popular uh, way to share files and acquire files. And, um, you know, like I, I said before, today's streaming services really, I think, that not overshadow piracy, but but make piracy less of a problem. Yeah. You know, the whole reason Spotify, or at least one of the reasons Spotify launched was to, was to offer a, a better uh, alternative to piracy. And I think the, the decline in piracy in the U.S. and in many other countries shows that, um, you know, that's the case, that, yeah. that streaming has helped solve some of this problem. Absolutely, both both on a video front with uh, with Netflix and on the audio front with, with Spotify and, and, and similar services. And uh, I mean, they, the, one of the, the, the interesting stories that came out this week around piracy, that was the next thing I was going to talk about, was uh, the fact that Extra Torrent, which is one of the most popular torrent sites on the web, has published the top 20 of the most pirated f files uh, since it went live in 2006. And uh, uh, so it looks like over the past uh, couple of years, uh, you know, in theory, uh, uh, the uh, availability of you know the exchange of music files should have gone down given the, how ubiquitous it is on YouTube and services like Spotify you can get it for free you don't have to pay for music essentially so why would you go and, and torrent it but uh, uh, looking at the top 20 there's actually quite a few I think 9 out of 20 of the entries are music entries and they're relatively recent ones at that including uh, 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 you know uh, albums by uh, Drake uh, Maroon 5 Jay-Z uh, Beyonce and even a track by Ariana Grande that was only released a few months back and so if those are the most uh, ever torrented files for uh, extra torrent uh, since 2006 and some of them are relatively recent it means that the volumes of some of those tracks are super high so uh, and they uh, does that surprise did that, that surprise you as well I i'm kind of uh, i didn't expect to see music in that list essentially i expected it to be all games games of thrones and stuff like that but uh, there was a lot of music on there yeah i would have expected to see like more films i mean i think the one thing that the list shows is that you know you can you can give people access to everything in the world but you can't convince them to have taste <laughs> so <laughs> it's not you know it's not a it's not a great list of stuff <laughs> no it's, it is not maroon five is up there then. right <laughs> <laughs> exactly maroon five number two <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, I'm for, yeah, that's 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 the truth. But uh, but I, I mean, uh, it's gonna be interesting to see. I would love to maybe have uh, the guys at Music Metric back on because they track torrents as well, right? Uh, yeah, and see what they are seeing on their end because uh, uh, in theory it's all, it's going down like we all think. But on the other side, if we see so, so something like Ariana Grande on there, then it means that her track must have been pirated. Like they must have pirated the hell out of it to get it on that list. Uh, so. <laughs> So again, an interesting, an interesting thing to to I think keep an eye on anyway. Because uh, and I mean the other thing is that you know, uh, Glenn, we're talking about our markets, you know, US and UK. Perhaps there is still a big component of illegal downloads happening in markets where the legal offering is not quite as wide. Yeah, these are these are um, downloads globally. Yeah, and when you get outside of the US, uh, there's going to be a lot more piracy relative to the size of the market. Um, you know, what this list tells me is that artists like Drake and Jay-Z and surprisingly Maroon 5 really have a global following. Yeah. I don't think anything could get on this list if it wasn't popular all around the world. Um, Western bands like this, Western artists, do translate really well all around the world. They really are popular. Yeah. They are downloaded just about anywhere. You're not going to see some American rock bands on here. You're not going to see country music on here. Some things don't travel well. Yeah. Uh, and, you're, and this reflects that. Now, uh, like Andy, I would have expected more, um, more movies on this. Um, movies that are really big franchises that, that uh, you know, there are a small number of movies relative to music. And so demand is really focused on a, a very small number of titles yeah uh, and some list i've seen in the past is much more skewed toward a small number of video titles than than audio so this is this is different than than some list i've seen in the past yeah so that's a little bit surprising um but you know popular music is popular and sometimes popular music is is popular all around the world and also that's basically what this says to me yeah and it's also easy to download right because like we're still talking about mp3s versus like gigabyte 
big gigabytes of downloads on, on for a video and, and a series is even bigger so i guess that's probably why there's not that many series in the list because you know if you want to download uh, 24 episodes or 12 episodes of an, a big franchise it's going to take you like 10 12 gigs which or maybe the series is broken up and yeah. if you actually aggregated and gave a series uh, one slot on this yeah. list it might make a list <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly but some of these are albums and actually some of these are just tracks yeah um so, um, I mean, the fact that Drake, a full album, is number one uh, says a lot more about Drake than just Maroon 5 having one track at number two. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, talking about, uh, you know, I wanted to talk about, go from piracy to uh, hard, you know, hard copies of music and talk a little bit about vinyl. It was a story that I essentially had to skip on last week because we didn't have any time. But uh, uh, vinyl seems to be continuing its resurgence. Uh, uh, you know, uh, sales of uh, vinyl in the UK uh, are projected to reach 1.2 million units by the end of the year in the UK. Uh, you know, this is according to figures released by the British phonographic industry. And uh, Pink Floyd's latest, latest record, The End Endless River, was deemed uh, to be the fastest selling vinyl album of the last 14 years. So quite an achievement for uh, Pink Floyd there. Uh, and, uh, you know, it kind of all goes back to the excitement that we uh, we felt on Record Store Day. It seems like it seems to be getting bigger every year. It's also creating problems around uh, pressing plants and the availability of pressing plants in the UK because there aren't enough machines to print enough vinyl, essentially, uh, these days. And so, uh, Andy, from, from your point of view, do you think we'll see this continue? Is this part of a wave of uh, sort of, uh, you know, going back to vinyl, but also sort of fashion and might not last quite as long? Or is it, is it a long term trend? I do, well, I mean, it's, you know, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. But I think uh, I think it will continue for a while yet, because I think as we move more and more over to streaming, uh, vinyl just becomes a thing to own. I think like a lot of a lot of the boom in vinyl sales is people just buying records to have something. Yeah. Um, and they're not even necessarily, you know, playing that music. I mean, in terms of it being a, a major resurgence, it's obviously a good thing. But at the same time, if you look at like the gr the graph of the lifetime of vinyl, like from if you look at the last 20 years, it's basically a flat line. It kind yeah. of, you know, saying that, saying that it's the highest since 1996 isn't really that big a jump from anywhere. <laughs> but, but, I mean, I think, you know, that, as, as people kind of want physical objects to show their fandom more than necessarily playing music, um, I think, that, like, vinyl wins out over CD because... You know, see, I don't know. There's just something nicer about a bit of vinyl. It, yeah. it feels like a, it feels like you know a nice thing to own, a nice thing to have. You can display it. You can put it in a frame if you want. Whereas the CD just kind of CDs feel, and partly because of the state of life CDs are at, CDs feel very disposable. Yeah. Um, so I think that's I think that's kind of what's largely driven the resurgence. Yeah. Uh, and Glenn, tell us about Nashville. I mean, it's it's a music city, right? And so, uh, how how are uh, record stores faring over there? Are, are, you know, do you see a trend of people uh, buying more vinyl? There is a lot of vinyl in in Nashville. Third Man Records is here. Uh, United Record Pressing is here, which does Third Man Records. Um, and the stores that have have remained over the years, or, or some have opened, are really the kind of independent stores where vinyl sells really well. Right. And to me, the story about vinyl is it's a format that has allowed independent record stores to survive. And some of these stores have not survived, obviously, but a lot of stores have opened up and there are vinyl only stores. There, there are some in L.A. specifically yeah. that have done really well. Um, so, you know, not too many years ago, people were really worried about independent music and uh, independent record stores closing left and right. And vinyl helps that out a lot. Uh, it's certainly not the only thing, but it, it's a very big component of that. And things like Record Store Day and uh, Black Friday, it's, it's Sister Day, have been very important to both vinyl and to independent record stores. Yeah. Um, so I think it is, uh, well, let's, let's be clear, the increases in vinyl are pretty small relative to the yeah. overall you know, recorded music business. Um, but they, they do serve a, a really important uh, role for the independent record community yeah and i think they serve consumers really well i mean there, there are some really cool um products out there and if you don't just want to stream something or have a download this is what you want yeah 
Yeah, and I think, you know, uh, you made a really good point there about independent labels because, you know, the, the main complaint that independent labels have on streaming is not maybe even the fact that they're not making enough money from it is the fact that they're not making money fast fast enough from it you know yeah. maybe in a 10 20 year window you know they might do very well out of it but uh they don't have the kind of financial infrastructure that a major label might have or a very large independent and so they can't sustain keeping making music yeah it, no that argument know? is made every now and then when when people are supporting or, or uh, making arguments for streaming services that yeah. streaming revenue can equal that of physical revenue. Well, it takes a long time. Yeah, it might take a year, might take two years, might take longer. And I know that that small record labels would rather have the money now rather than have the money trickle in over three years. Yeah, exactly. Because each and every artist is a big investment for them. And so at least if they can pack in a couple of thousand vinyl sales, you know, they might it might make a dent in in their expenses and you know keep them afloat essentially as the streaming royalties start coming in, which is definitely very important for for independent labels and we want to see more of that. And on Spotify released a, 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 a mini site called Your Year in Music, and essentially it showcases some of the biggest releases on Spotify over the past year. Uh, uh, you know, uh, with Ed Sheeran on, on top uh, uh, for, for the top five albums, then Sam Smith, then Iggy Azalea, then Pharrell Williams and Ariana Grande. But you can also customize uh, the list. And if you log in with your uh, Spotify details, it will show you what the biggest, uh, uh, you know, uh, Spotify uh, uh, artists were for you and uh, sort of break it down by genre. You might see things you don't, don't want to see or you might see that you listen to more pop than you think you, you do. And uh, <laughs> so it's, it's an interesting thing, thing to look at. And, uh, you know, it's a really nicely laid out mini site uh, uh, and uh, uh, I, I would encourage people to go and check it out uh, on, on Spotify. Uh, Andy, have you have you checked it out and uh, uh, do you think that we're going to see, you know, more of this come from different services and, and uh, you know, f you know, g getting them to give you a bit more of a personal experience so that you feel more uh, uh, connected to the, to the company itself? Yeah, I don't know why more people, more streaming services don't do that because I think right. it's a really, like, it's a nice thing to have at the end of the year, like, just kind of being able to look back over i mean it's not necessarily a surprise because no, exactly, I, yeah. I i know i know what i listened to a lot this year because i was listening to it but you know it's quite nice it was interesting they introduced i don't think they had last year the genre breakdown and it right. was interesting to see that because i'm not sure that was entirely accurate to what i listened to yeah my apparently wasn't. 17 yeah 17 percent of my listening this year was chaotic hardcore apparently nice <laughs> yeah not just hardcore, chaotic. Chaotic hardcore, hardcore right. <laughs> well done. <laughs> <laughs> I would say. Uh, yeah, just, that was just after pop. So, yeah. you know, pop still wins out. <laughs> <laughs> Glenn, have you, have you checked yours out? <laughs> well, I've looked at the, the main site, yeah. uh, the main year in review. I haven't got into any details about my listening. Um, <laughs> I think it's a, look, I think it's a good site. I think it's the kind of thing that streaming services need to do because they need to be more than just a catalog of 30 million songs. And the the trend in streaming is clearly toward editorial, uh, toward the kind of unique content that makes people, you know, want to visit, want to visit often. And it has to be more than just catalogs, playlists, and a few recommendations. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I looked over it. It looks fine. I mean, uh, what it really told me is I have nothing in common with the average Spotify listener. I, I had no interest in any of the artists. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's true. And uh, and it's it's kind of funny because uh, it, it it brought me back to when I used to do that with Last of Fam and go back and and look at what I've been listening to over the over the previous year. Unfortunately, Last of Fam has lost that role. I mean, I, I still scrabble, but I've never I haven't been on the site for maybe a year at this point uh, so uh, it's a shame that they've lost that position as being that the, the gatekeeper of all your music listening habits yeah I mean I still I still go back to last FM at the end of the year and check out when we're kind of planning our end of year stuff our artists of the right. year um, you know, articles I do go back and see what the what the you know, artists and tracks that were you know I was listening to most were so I, I do still use last FM for that yeah. um, but I mean, most of my listening probably does come from Spotify, so it's very similar. Yeah, 
Yeah, sure. And uh, I wanted to finish the close the show by talking about SoundCloud. And so this is a news that came out yesterday from the Wall Street Journal. And uh, they usually have pretty good sources. Uh, it's, the article has three uh, contributors as writers. And uh, they quote uh, sources familiar with the situation, with knowledge of the situation, uh, by saying that SoundCloud is in the process of raising another $150 million, uh, in funding, uh, which would be based on a $1.2 billion valuation. So as far as I could find out, uh, at least on Chrome, base uh, and a couple of other sources uh, SoundCloud has only raised around 123 million in funding so far uh, so this would mean that the the next round would be actually bigger than you know the entire you know funding they've had uh, to date uh, on the service which can only mean that they would want to scale the service to like a, a Spotify level or you know a, a big they want to become a big streaming service essentially if they, they took that much funding at that valuation I mean obviously uh, I also think this is probably the riskiest round for investors uh, because uh, the company has some big issues, uh, namely the fact that they haven't managed to close deals with uh, two of the uh, uh, biggest uh, majors uh, in the world yet because the majors haven't seen uh, a viable business model uh, at the moment uh, and the, the CEO of Universal was quoted on that actually uh, uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, and yeah, I mean, surprising to see them going after that much money but I guess it's necessary because now it's a big operation to have uh, hundreds of employees a number of offices so you really need that kind of money to, to keep going uh, uh, Andy we've talked about SoundCloud loads on the show obviously but uh, yeah. w w what what are your thoughts on, on, on the new round and, and you know do you think uh, it's, it's achievable on, on, on that valuation I don't know it kind of it's the SoundCloud you know in a a strange position now because I think it's kind of it's, it's reaching a valuation now that it's I mean, the, you know, 1.2 billion is is, is off-putting for buyers because you know when are you going to make your money back? And, and SoundCloud has to do in order to get buyers. SoundCloud has to do so much in terms of you know getting you know, Sony and Universal on board. Yeah, um, and, and you know not just not the majors, but you know everyone else. Um, and uh, I don't know, it's 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 a lot of money to be raising, but I think they probably need it to yeah. to achieve their goals. But it's it's getting to the stage now where it's you know it. it it's not a foregone conclusion that they'll succeed in, in being able to you know make their money back and sell the company yeah um, once they once they reach that goal no, it's, no you, uh, that's a great point actually it's a catch-22 situation where they need to raise the money and therefore they need that valuation to be there uh, uh, because yeah, uh, they yeah. wouldn't be able to raise 150 million on a 700 million valuation uh, but at the same time the fact that the valuation has been pushed up also makes it a lot harder for them to sell which makes it harder for investors to get their money back so it's 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 a difficult situation right now and yeah uh, yeah they can't you know there's there's no turning back but 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 going forward i don't know i mean it, i'd like to see them you know kind of come out of this well and, yeah. it, and it will be you know i think you know soundcloud is a great thing and i think it has the potential to you know to develop into whatever it's going to develop into next could also be a, a great thing but yeah it's i don't know it's, it's hard to know no it's <laughs> what, impossible to know yeah. exactly uh, glenn have you have you uh, what are the conversations that are going on your end uh, uh, around soundcloud have you had any conversations over the last few months and and uh, uh, how, uh, how how do they pan out <laughs> well uh I've had some conversations. I'm, I'm really not privy to anything that's going on inside of the company. Sure. Uh, I do disagree that this is the riskiest uh, uh, round of funding. I think it's the safest round of funding. Right. Uh, it is a lot of money, but SoundCloud is far more established than it was in, during you know, angel investing, during the first round when it, it had not grown into what it is today. It has, yeah. well, the Wall Street Journal article says 175 million unique listeners each month. Um, it, it has a huge footprint and if I don't know anything else about internet companies I know that if you have a footprint that big you can get funding and you can probably turn it into some kind of business now the amount of funding that they're raising in this round 150 million is really a signal that that's going for licensing that's not going for staff that's yeah. not going for offices that's going for licensing so they can expand this service to many more countries, if not all around the world, to have the kind of deals they need to have in place to stream popular music and to share that revenue with rights holders. So uh, it is, it, it's a little different of a service. It's not a subscription service. It's not an internet radio service. Um, I don't know how that plays into how this ultimately works out. Yeah. And 
how it, you know, what kind of revenue it can raise. Yeah. Uh, where do they insert ads? <laughs> you know, how, how is that going to hurt the, the listener experience? Uh, you know, these are, these are big questions. Yeah. But I think when, when you have a product that really is loved by a lot of people and that has such a big footprint, um, I think you have a pretty good chance for success. Um, you know, Twitter, uh, according to reports, balked at, at buying it last year or maybe it was earlier this year. You know, that might be an acquisition that could happen later. And, um, you know, if it's going to make Twitter a lot better, a billion dollars isn't that much money. Yeah. No, that's right. And, and, you know, you're totally right about, you know, it not being the riskiest one. Of course, the riskiest one is always the, the, the first couple of rounds. Uh, I was just, uh, I guess I was, I was referring to maybe like a couple of years ago when the company had a real momentum already and it, it wasn't really necessary for them to yet find out what their business model was going to be. Whilst now it seems like they really have to figure out what their business model is going to be. And so in that sense, it's a little risky because they don't appear to have one you know, really nailed down quite yet. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we know roughly what it is. Yeah. It's, it's ad-supported streaming. Um, now, what that means to the product, yeah, no, I don't think we know yet, and that's that certainly is the big question. Um, Absolutely. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of a, an in-between product, like I said. It's, it's not a subscription service. It's not internet radio. Uh, it's not just a, a, basically a, an online storage and sharing service, which yeah. is what it it was launched as uh, it's really evolved over the time yeah but it's clear that the company says you know we need to we need to take our shot we need to find out the best path forward um, it thinks that being a licensed music service is that path it's hired uh, Jeff Toy from Cricket it's hired Stephen Bryant from Warner Music um, it's, it's clear that they've made their bet on that direction yeah and uh, as we see from these numbers it's a pretty big bet yeah absolutely and uh, and finally uh, I guess I should mention that if you had decided to bulk buy iPods uh, uh, a few months ago the classic iPods uh, now you'd be making quite a bit of money because apparently they are selling for uh, two to three times the uh, recommended retail price at Apple before Apple decided to discontinue them we're talking about the iPod classic uh, the one that had 160 gigabyte and and uh, uh, you know the spinny drive inside it rather than a solid state uh, obviously the, those are kind of capacities that uh, are not yet available on on normal iPods and would cost you an arm and a leg if you did want the 128 gigabyte uh, uh, version anyway. So uh, interesting to see that uh, people are snapping those up. Although it kind of it was inevitable that there would be sort of a bit of a retro uh, a renaissance of the device as soon as it was pulled. A bit like when Polaroid uh, decided to pull the camera and everybody went out and, and started buying them. So uh, yeah, not not a huge amount to comment on there. But if you, if you do want a, a, an old style iPod, you should be prepared to spend between uh, 400 and, and 600 pounds which is anywhere between 700 and a thousand dollars at this point so uh, quite a bit of a chunk of money to uh, uh, get rid of to get an old school iPod and uh, uh, well guys it was a, a real pleasure having you on the show today uh, please uh, let me know if there's anything that you want to plug or any particular pieces that you sh I should direct people to uh, Glenn anything you're in well I, I just want to add that um in a new magazine article uh, about Apple, um, right. I, I did say at the end of it, and uh, well, I don't know what's going to end up in the magazine, but <laughs> I was talking about the the fact that Apple had cut, um, you know, just ceased uh, manufacturing and selling of this uh, classic iPod, and I said nostalgia sells in live music, but it doesn't sell in uh, personal electronics. Now, I should have put an asterisk next to that because there clearly are some small number of people who are willing to pay a lot of money uh, for nostalgia, and that's really what this is. Yeah. Uh, it's a good device, but I think they're being nostalgic, and that, that's reflected in the price. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so look for that article in, in whatever final form it is in the Billboard's year-end issue. Okay, great. Awesome. And uh, also you can go and check out uh, uh, Glenn's Twitter feed on at Billboard Glenn. And uh, if you search for him on Billboard's site, you can find all his pieces as well or on Google News as well. Uh, and uh, Andy, for, from your end, of course, uh, it's uh, CMU... Compl no, it's compl ah, I always get the, <laughs> I always get the URL wrong. It's terrible. Uh, complete Music Update... Dot com? No, it's wrong yes. again. <laughs> That was right. That's no, right. Okay, great. Complete music update, uh, update dot com uh, for uh, CMU's uh, newsletter. Of course, uh, uh, you guys have both uh, a free and a paid version of it now, so that's uh, that's quite exciting. Yeah, yeah. 
So the free the free version that goes out every day, you can go and sign up for that for free. Why why wouldn't you? And exactly. uh, and uh, the the uh, the premium version, you get uh, if you pay not very much money really for that, uh, you get regular reports on what's going on in the music industry. And the latest edition is about to go out. So if you sign up this week, you'll get that. And then uh, a review of the year in January. Nice. And uh, uh, obviously, uh, uh, you should also look out for uh, Andy's weekly rants on a Friday, I believe, uh, <laughs> which uh, are getting better and better. So I'm really enjoying those. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and there was a, an amazing one about Taylor Swift a, a couple of months back <laughs> uh, and uh, that's all for this week uh, thanks so much for sticking with us uh, this week uh, and uh, listening to the show uh, this is uh, the penultimate show before uh, we break for the holidays next week we're going to do a little bit of a uh, round up and look at the year uh, uh, behind us that we're leaving behind and see what's been happening that's been exciting uh, and uh, uh, thanks so much for joining me guys once again uh, and thanks for listening have a fantastic week and until next time 